In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I first started seminary, studying to become a priest, I met Dan, and very quickly we figured out that we wanted to get married. The first couple of years of our relationship, though, were marked by a lot of worrying, a lot of agonized worrying about how being married to one another might compete with our calling to be priests of the church. What if we couldn't get jobs in the same city? What if we had to choose between living together and being able to take a pastoral call? Were we going to be diminishing our capacity to follow those lives of ordained service to which we believed that we were called if we were to join our lives to one another. We did get married. We both got ordained. And then our agonized worrying shifted. It shifted toward the question of children. I was passionately wanting to have children. But Dan and I were not at all sure how we could possibly balance the responsibilities of leading churches with the responsibilities of parenthood. At the time, we didn't live anywhere near any of our parents. And we were very aware that there are no daycare centers that operate at a lot of the odd hours of our jobs, especially weekends and weekday evenings. We wanted to become parents, but we were not at all sure that that would be faithful if it impacted our calling to be priests of the church. Now this story this morning is not a story about how everything all worked out for us. It's also not a story about whitewashing the very real challenges of trying to juggle a lot of different responsibilities and different relationships. I could tell you all kinds of amazing stories about how things did work out for us, and often in incredibly surprising ways that we didn't expect. I sure could tell you a lot of stories about the angels around us who stepped up in our family, in our friendships, in our church, in order to help us navigate all of that juggling act and those responsibilities. But the reason why I share this story with you this morning is because in this context, what it really was is a story of discernment. It's a story of how we discerned those major life choices at critical junctures in our lives. And we were really blessed in those early years of our marriage and relationship that we both separately saw the same spiritual director, this really wise woman named Audrey. And what Audrey kept calling each of us back to in all of this agonized worrying was this basic central truth. She kept reminding us that the same God who was calling us to be priests of the church was also the God who was calling us to be married and was also the God who was calling us into parenthood. The source of all of those vocations was the same and she called us and invited us to keep seeing how those different vocations of our lives were not actually in competition with one another. Again, that's not to say that there weren't real challenges in figuring out how it all fit together, but she kept 
inviting us back into seeing how God was with us in discerning those major life choices and how those different components of our lives were not actually set up as a test of our faithfulness. Now in today's gospel passage, we do have a test. We have a test that is very explicitly set up for Jesus. And it's set up by some unlikely allies because the Herodians and the Pharisees, two different sects of religious leadership, they are usually enemies of one another, but they find that they are united in their hatred of Jesus and their desire to see him silenced. And they come up with what they think is a pretty airtight plan into getting rid of him once and for all. They set up this test, this trick, this trap for him. And they ask Jesus, first buttering him up with all kinds of compliments about what a great and wise teacher he is. And then they say, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor? Now it looks like Jesus is in a lose-lose situation here. Because if he says that it is lawful to pay those taxes, well, he is going to lose credibility with most of his followers. Most of his followers who feel the tremendous weight of Roman oppression and the weight of Roman taxation and how that impoverishes them. They are looking for liberation from this oppression and taxation and injustice. And if Jesus is to say, well, don't worry about any of that, then his followers might think that he doesn't have much to say to them. On the other hand, if Jesus says, no, don't pay the taxes, well, then these religious leaders have a really good case to make to say that Jesus is a rebel and an insurrectionist and needs to be put to death. This is a really good story to shine a light on just how quick-witted Jesus really is. Because his response is fast, and it's pretty straightforward, and it's incredibly brilliant. He says, okay, well, bring me a coin whose image is on that coin. Well, it's the image of Caesar. And so Jesus gives this quite famous teaching that has been analyzed every which way for 2,000 years since. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Give to God the things that are God's. In this teaching, he gives a profound truth, a very basic truth, but what he doesn't do is he doesn't give black and white answers, and he doesn't give a rule book for what faithful living looks like. Instead, he invites people to discernment. Discernment within the context of relationship. Because of course the truth is that it's all God's. Give to God the things that are God's, it's all God's. That coin belongs to God, the people belong to God, the Herodians and Pharisees belong to God, even Caesar belongs to God. And within the context of that relational discernment, what Jesus does is create space for different ways of seeing faithful response. So he makes room for people to stand up and speak out and to be part and parcel of how the world is changed for the better and how injustice is called out. And of course, we can point to all kinds of examples in Jesus' ministry where he does just this, where he lays his neck on the line for the sake of speaking up for the dignity and the well-being and the truth of others. 
But at the same time, he also creates the space for those places where it might be necessary to submit to a worldly power and to do so with a sense of agency knowing that all of those worldly powers are fleeting, that they'll come and go. The Pontius Pilots, the King Herods, the Caesars, they'll come and go. And the eternal power of God will be revealed. And of course, we can see this kind of action and this kind of choice maybe most powerfully in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So how does this apply to us? How does this apply to us in our world today seeking to make faithful choices? Well, I would say that as with a lot of Jesus' teachings, there is very much a political collective way of understanding what Jesus has to say. And there is also a very personal, soulful level and dimension to what it is that Jesus has to say. On the political collective level, I think that we can hear Jesus' teaching today as carving out a sort of middle ground and common ground across all of the very strident, polarized public discourse that tends to mark how we talk about things today. It is all too easy for conversation to be completely thwarted in favor of people just yelling their opinions at one another and pointing their fingers at one another. And yet, what if, across all of the difficult conversations that we have to have, what if we started with this basic premise? Give to God the things that are God's. Recognizing that we all belong to God. We're all beloved children of God. We are all stamped with the image and likeness of God. And everything that we do and everything that we say needs to start with that compassionate recognition of one another's worth and needs to be driven by how we bring our world closer to God's vision of justice and peace for all. I can't help particularly thinking, of course, of the war in Israel and Hamas right now. And I think of how quick world leaders are to take sides in this war and how the taking of sides escalates the violence and how easy it is to overlook the humanitarian needs of Palestinians, how easy it is for anti-Semitism to raise its ugly head in our world again today, and how important it is for our prayers and our words and our advocacy to be grounded in this central realization that we're all God's children, that every one of God's children needs to be treated with dignity and worth, that God's desire for all of us is to have our world drawn more in line to God's vision of peace and justice for all of us. On that personal level, that personal level of the discernments that we need to make in our life's choices. I hear a real symmetry between Jesus' words today, give to God the things that are God's, and that truth that our spiritual director, Audrey, kept calling us back to as we were trying to sort out some of our major life choices. I think of a friend of mine who was on my floor in residence when I was in seminary that first year. 
and she was studying music. And every now and then she would have an agonized conversation with me about wondering whether becoming a musician was really a faithful choice, whether she should be doing something more religious with her life. What was music going to give to God's world? But what if her music is from God? What if her violin belongs to God? What if her calling as a musician belongs to God? What if it isn't either or? What if everything that she offers as a musician is part and parcel of her loving service to God and how God's love and beauty is revealed in the world? What if my ministry as a priest belongs to God? And what if my vocation as a parent and a wife and a friend and a member of the community, what if that all belongs to God? With, what if all of the parts of your life belong to God? All of the relationships, all of the responsibilities, what if they all belong to God? It's not that it isn't tough and challenging sometimes to sort out that juggling act of how we manage different responsibilities and relationships. But it is to say that we're not alone in doing so. It is to say that we make our life choices discerning within the context of our relationship with God. It is to say that God doesn't compartmentalize the parts of our lives that are religious and prayerful and that God cares about, and then the rest of it that just doesn't matter. And it is to say that God is so fully invested in how each one of us, in the whole of our lives, every part of our lives, becomes more and more and more fully that complete expression of who God has created and called us to be. Amen.